<laughs> Welcome everybody to COS 33 and we're absolutely delighted to have Gordon Dale with a panel of absolutely wonderful people talking to us about how they're preparing for Passover in a time of pandemic and to create spiritually moving and worthwhile services. So uh, Gordon, um, it's over to you if you unmute and um, you'll introduce your speakers as you go along. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Um, and uh, thank you to you and to uh, Laurie and to Mark Kligman, who uh, was so helpful in setting this up um, for the invitation to present today. I'm so pleased to be here and uh, how much more so that I get to do so with some of my esteemed colleagues from the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music, the Cantorial School at Hebrew Indian College, Jewish Institute of Religion. I'll introduce them momentarily. So before I do, um, I'd just like to take a moment to frame our conversation. Um, it really is fortuitous that our panel is taking place on this particular Tuesday. Um, just last week, the Jewish people celebrated the holiday of Purim and are now beginning to look toward Passover, which is less than four weeks away. And it was at precisely this time last year between Purim and Passover that synagogues in America began to close their doors due to the coronavirus reaching the United States. The closing of synagogues cuts across denominational divides to be a profoundly painful um, moment in Jewish history, and also one that has inspired a lot of creativity. Um, I think that the story is actually very complicated, and it has led to changes in the ways that Jews think about technology, community, the role of clergy, and the very nature of prayer. While I would argue that these things have touched all practicing Jews uh, in whatever shape that takes. Uh, today we'll be focusing on non-Orthodox communities and the ways that music and prayer have changed during this past year as constraints have led to a blossoming of creativity. It's not lost on me that this mirrors the Passover story, which is beginning to be on our minds at this time. Uh, the name for Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, which means constraints. And as we weather this modern day plague and try to navigate its constraints, what does it mean to be a leader of prayer? What is the role of music in Jewish prayer during this time? So to help us address these questions, we have four of my colleagues from the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music. I think so highly of all of these individuals. Um, and like our faculty broadly, this is a diverse group. And each one brings something unique to the education that we offer our students and to our discussion today. You can learn more about each of these individuals and hear their music with a quick Google search, but I do wanna take just a moment to introduce them now. Um, so first I'll introduce, we're just going alphabetically. Um, uh, Mary Levenger Arian is HUCJIR's faculty artist in liturgical arts and music education at the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music. She teaches courses related to contemporary congregational worship, in addition to courses in music education and conducting. Her newest book is Leveling the Praying Field, Methods and Melodies to Elevate Congregational Worship. Cantor Jonathan Commissar is a composer of Jewish classical and theater music. He's a sought after composer of Jewish music from synagogues across North America. Cantor Commissar has served on the faculty of the Debbie Friedman School of Music since 2009, teaching classes on music theory, arranging, and composition. Joyce Rosenzweig is the faculty artist in Jewish music and performance in the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music. She's an internationally recognized pianist, conductor, educator, coach, arranger, and specialist in Jewish art and synagogue music. Joyce is the music director of Congregation Beit Simchat Torah in Manhattan and has toured all around the world performing Jewish music. Cantor Ozzy Schwartz is the senior cantor of Park Avenue Synagogue in New York, world renowned vocal performer and recording artist whose music reaches both Jewish and interfaith audiences internationally. Dedicated to cultivating the next generation of cantors, Ozzy serves on faculty of all major cantorial schools and serves as treasurer for the Cantors Assembly, the largest professional organization for cantors. This is such an all-star panel. <laughs> Thank you all for agreeing uh, to be a part of this conversation. 
Um, so uh, the, the format will be as follows. I've sent the panelists four questions uh, to consider ahead of time. I'll ask these questions and then we'll go around and give each panelist a few minutes to reply. Um, I've asked the panelists to keep their answers on the concise side so that we can have time for question and answer session. Um, I know that some of my colleagues have to go either teach or um, deal with synagogue emergencies as is the life of a cantor um, at some point. So um, we're, we'll just roll with it. And um, I, I just wanna thank you all for, for being here. Um, so if anybody does have a question for one of the panelists that doesn't get to be asked today, I'd invite you to uh, send it to me um, either in the chat or, or shoot me an email and I'll be happy to facilitate that communication. Um, so thank you so much to the panelists for being here. Uh, thank you again to the International Forum for the invitation and thank you to everyone uh, who's in attendance. So let's begin. Um, I'll ask the, the first question and then we'll uh, just go around. So to begin, um, I just would like to give everyone uh, a sense of the work that each of you do, each of you panelists do. So if you could please briefly describe the ways that your communal work has changed over the past year. Uh, what do services look like in your community these days? And how have your musical choices changed since before the pandemic? Let's just uh, go around. Uh, how about we'll start with Mary Arian. Okay, well, thank you, Gordon. I am equally excited to have to share you as part of the colleagues that I get to work with. So thank you. Um, a few ways that the worship has changed. One, of course, is that we're largely doing this over Zoom. That's the platform that I'm privileged enough to use because the congregations that I lead are small enough. Um, and being on Zoom versus being on live stream means that I can see the faces of my kahal and they can see each other. So that's one thing. Um, the length of the worship services have been shortened. And that's just our knowledge, what we've all learned in education also, the importance of recognizing Zoom fatigue. I would also say that as we've now uh, reached almost the year mark, that's changing. And congregants actually have emailed me and said, you know, I kind of missed that we're not doing this, might we include it now? So that, that's growing. Um, a major change for me in terms of how I lead is I particularly love um, including new melodies, new interpretations of a liturgy and teaching some new music during the worship. Um, I'm reticent to do that. I have been reticent to do that during the pandemic. Um, adding new music uh, pushes the comfort level, right? We're not doing melodies that people are familiar with. And living in an un as unfamiliar time as we are now living in, familiar music seems to be more um, what people need. The other thing is that learning new music within worship is supported by people being able to hear their neighbors sing the new melody. And they can't hear that support. On the flip side, Zoom does add one positive thing. I remember a congregant writing to me after worship on one, one week, and he said to me, you know, Mary, I'm usually really embarrassed to sing out in the synagogue because my voice isn't very good. But on Zoom, in my living room, I am singing full-throated. So that's one of the upsides of the change during this time. Thank you so much. Um, let's turn to Cantor Jonathan Commissar, please. Thank you, Gordon. Again, I want to echo what Mary said. Uh, you're a, a real treasure to our faculty and to the, to the students at, at HUC. Um, I wear a lot of different hats in the different things that I do. Um, I, I'm a kolbo. I'm a spiritual leader, sole spiritual leader of a small congregation in New Jersey. Um, my transfer from in-person worship to um, Zoom worship has been relatively easy because I, I lead with a keyboard and so I, it becomes my, my Steinway piano in my living room and everyone gathers around the Zoom. Um, I feel like uh, not a lot has changed because I have a, you know, I have a small operation basically, uh, but I, there's a lot of um, finding the balance between acknowledging how things are abnormal and wanting to just make things move forward as in, in a quote unquote normal way as possible. So finding that, walking that tightrope. Um, I feel like uh, the, the power and importance of music has really been highlighted during this whole year. 
Um, in fact, one of my high holiday sermon was about this very fact that music is um, is not an extracurricular little frilly extra out in there in the world. It is essential to body, soul, mind, health, and well-being. Um, and you know those those, uh, those four notes of Kol Nidre, the four notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Those are life-changing and world-changing events, and people need music in ways that um, they're they're acknowledging in ways that they haven't before. So I would say um, honing in on the fact of uh, of music's essential um, power and uh, role in our lives that keeps coming back in my in my congregational and teaching life. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, let's turn to Joyce Rosenzweig, please. Thank you so much, Gordon. I'm getting, uh, thank you, sorry, Joyce, to interrupt you. Thank you to those who are sending me uh, questions. I'll, I'm gonna collect them and, and we'll have a chance to ask them in a little while. Sorry to interrupt you, Joyce, go That's right okay. Ahead. I was thanking you, Gordon, um, as, as you have been thanked before for coordinating this and, and for all that you do for us at HUC. And just to say, it's incredible to see such a, an auspicious group of people gathered together. Um, and I send my greetings. Um, so I am the music director at Congregation Beit Simcha Torah in Manhattan. Um, and uh, I am privileged to work with the very great Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum and um, Sam Rosen, who is um, a marvelous cantorial student at HUC now. And, um, uh, the three of us together have really, I would say we pivoted in a big way, very quickly at the start of the pandemic. Um, so we have our, our services are now, um, we each leave from our homes. And I've, tr I've turned my um, area where my piano is into sort of a little Shabbos station. And um, um, it's, it's rather amazing how this whole thing has unfolded. Um, the, we realized we needed to upgrade our tech um, immediately. We hired um, our regular sound person to be with us on a much more uh, robust, uh, in a much more robust way. And we, um, we now have little, almost looks like little recording studios in each of our homes. And um, I am involved in the uh, planning of planning and playing of the Friday night services, um, uh, as well as High Holy Days and you know other services. But I, I'm not involved in the Shabbat morning services, which are a cappella. Um, one of the things that I guess I would say is that in our shul, music, as has been said by the others, music is very central, and we knew that we didn't want to have to compromise. Uh, what we do. We just needed to find um, a platform and ways to do this. So how we have kind of um, done this dance is that I, I record uh, piano tracks now. I've recorded literally hundreds and hundreds of piano tracks through this, uh, through this year um, that now encompasses our, I mean, so much of our um, of our liturgy and of the various selections that we that we do, um, and we keep adding every week. I I add at least three more tracks, and we've been able to now um, do. In a, in addition to the liturgy, we also have been able to recognize, um, let's say, Kristallnacht, and do special music for that, for the night of the murdered Yiddish poets in August, for Martin Luther King Day. And each, and it's been, I feel like this the congregation has been on a journey with us, hearing the music that they're used to hearing that we never would take away, but adding and, um, and combining. And um, it's been, you know, it's been so much work for all of us, I would say. And um, for our, um, for Sam, our cantor, our brilliant cantorial student, he works with my tracks in learning how to sing, learning each, the phrasing that I've that I've put down, we talk about them, he, and he works. And what happens is the part I didn't tell you yet is that I'm actually on the screen on Friday nights playing in my home on on mute, and it's um, 
and I'm playing. But what you're, what the congregation is hearing is a pre-recorded track. So the energy is there of, of um, as if this was really happening in real time, but, uh, and people can't believe that they, they don't want to believe that this is um, not a live uh, presentation. So it's been very dynamic and has worked maybe too well because a lot of our congregants don't understand why we want to go back so desperately to being together in the sanctuary. So it's, um, it's a very interesting thing. I'll just say um, uh, that High Holy Days, we were in person, the three of us, and um, we were um, we, with a, a brilliant um, film company and um, that was an extraordinary experience and made I believe the the uh, the services very intimate and very alive um, and we can talk more as for the other questions thank you thank you Joyce uh, we'll turn to Cantor Ozzy Schwartz so hi everybody, it's good to see you and Gordon, thank you again for putting it all together. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's since this, this pandemic, I have been impressed by all of my colleagues, the cantors and the uh, uh, professionals in, in Jewish music. Guys, I want you to all know that as defined by the governor of the state of New York, you are all essential workers. And I, sometimes we tend to forget this, but, but I think um, I have seen my colleagues, um, you know, rising up for the occasion and being there and being present for our communities, for people in the time that they needed us most, more than any other synagogue professionals, um, the cantors and the Jewish musicians have been there to comfort, to, to provide a sense of normalcy, to provide a sense of, of, uh, of hope. Um, and and, and I, I, I want to congratulate all of you for the amazing, amazing work that you've been doing um, in, in our field. Um, so I'm the senior cantor of Park Avenue Synagogue, and, and um, I've been there for the last 12 years. I'm responsible for the worship and music um, at PAS, which is the face and foundation of our community, both for our members and, and worldwide. Um, I, I'm a partner to, to, um, uh, to my amazing rabbi, uh, Rabbi Elliot Kasparov, on leading the spiritual and pastoral life of our community. And of course, with the chairman of the board to set the vision and mission for our community. And lastly, you know, we, we have a big team. So I'm part of the senior management team in lead, leadership of, it, of the whole staff, the budget and policies of the synagogue. Um, again, a lot of challenges since the pandemic hit from all different kinds. Um, a lot to care for, and uh, we had to pivot it really quickly to 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 the virtual world. We've been streaming services for the past six years before the pandemic, so in a way, uh, not a lot changed. But on the other hand, everything changed. The difference is that uh, while before that it was about um, streaming what's happening in the synagogue, now it changed into bringing people from home virtually into the synagogue, which is very, very different. Um, I, I, again, like what you've heard here, I, I found myself um, doing something I haven't learned to do in a cantorial school, which is to run a tech team uh, <laughs> and, and learn all about the miracles of technology and live stream and Zoom and the interaction between and uh, a lot of our success actually was right in that area of really building a studio of connecting different rooms in the same building so you can make music together uh, and, and, and maintain the quality of music that is so hard to transfer um, over, over screen in general, but especially over Zoom. Um, the music, again, I'm hearing from my colleagues and very much like, like here, um, familiarity, normalcy, um, those, those sentiments are very important, but also um, try to, to, to create and try to uh, bring some new music and, and, and new hope. Um, uh, again, being present was, was very, very uh, uh, important. Um, I haven't personally missed, uh, 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 we, we went into our building, again, as essential workers, only the music team not anyone else, um, since the pandemic hits in a very safe way, um, that was very important to us, uh, but to go into the building so we can show the sanctuary, we can present the music as it vibrates in that beautiful room. Um, and uh, um, 
and, and maintain that, you know, usually we take a break over the summer, at the end of December, there was no break this year. We, we, we just had to be there for our members and, and people from all over the world, um, week after week after week. On a personal note, I also noticed that my singing changed a lot. Um, and uh, there, there, there is something physical about that that is very different, and we'll talk about this in the other questions, but um, the idea of, of facilitating a community and building a global connection um, and, and, and making it all work. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ozzy. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. And to begin, I want to, um, to quote, uh, I'm actually quoting Mary Arian, who's here on the, the screen. Uh, Mary wrote a, um, a, an article, a HUC's website that's called Scriptions, Jewish Thoughts and Responses to COVID-19. I'd encourage everybody to go and check that out after our program. So Mary explains, and I'm going to put this quote in, uh, in the chat in just a moment. We read in Kohelet, there's a time for embracing and a time to refrain from embracing. This is from Ecclesiastes 3.5. Yes, this is a time in which we need to be mindful about how we embrace and whom we embrace. But I would caution, this is not a time to refrain from embracing. This is a time to look even deeper into the words and melodies we pray and embrace the new meanings we can call from them. Mary's commentary on Kohelet invites us to think deeply about new meanings in music and liturgy that can be gleaned based on a new context. So I'd like to ask the panelists to expand on this idea and think about what it means to lead a community in prayer in our contemporary unusual context. So there's a two part uh, question here. Part A, in your community, what does it mean to be a leader of prayer during these times? And part B, how does one create or maintain a spiritually connected Seabor uh, con uh, community during the era of social distance? So uh, let's go in the same order. Mary, please. Thank you, Gordon. Um, now I know one more person that read the article. <laughs> My husband and you. No, okay, we'll move on. Um, how has my leadership changed? For me, there are three principles that guide me as a leader of prayer. The first is da lifne mi ata omed. That's clear. Know before whom you stand. What is this all about? What, who am I serving, right? Um, but also, dalif ne mi ata omed. Who am I standing before with a small w? Who is my congregation and what are my congregation's needs? That's the first principle of leadership for me. The second is that my congregants need to feel seen and they need to feel heard, which is a real challenge during the pandemic. And the third is that the prayers need to be relevant to their lives now. Those principles for me have not changed during the pandemic. I knew what my congregants needed on the Shabbat following George Floyd's murder, just as all of us knew on the Shabbat following 9-11. I know the pain and loss and fear that my congregants are experiencing as the death toll numbers rise from COVID-19. I know the isolation that people are feeling when they can't visit an elderly parent in a nursing home or hold that new grandchild in their arms. The challenge is now, how do I help my congregants feel seen and heard and connected to this sacred community that we're committed to building? I need to find ways to pierce, literally pierce the screen. And one of the ways I've had to learn, as Ozzy mentioned, we all become these techies, which is really a huge learning curve for me. Thank God for my students, I must say. So we need to learn how to use the technology to help pierce the screen. And the first thing I've learned is that the screen is valuable real estate. That is where you can see your congregants and they can see each other. So I think a lot about gallery view versus speaker view. And I am continually telling my congregants, click off of my voice, 
click onto gallery view so you can see each other. That's one way. Another way is to send PDFs of the service, not using the screen to project texts, because that's not what they need to see. We can send them PDFs. Large synagogues, excuse me, large synagogues that I know of are having drive-bys where congregants pick up a copy of the Siddur that they keep in their home or pick up the Machsor for the high holidays. Um, and, the other, and then, of course, you know, uh, congregants can use an alternate device to see the text but be able to see each other. And the other issue is how to honor other voices, just like we would do live, to create moments of honor where someone is called up to light the candles and someone else has an aliyah, yes? And this can be done on Zoom just by getting the other congregant to unmute. Or as Joyce suggested in terms of pre-recordings, you're inviting someone, you help them, you pre-record it, and you project it during the service. And finally, and I, I guess I referred to that in the article, I need to dig deeper and embrace the texts and melodies of our tradition that will help them in this incredible time of need. Thank you very much. Let's move to Kent Kramsar. Yeah, uh, I feel like, uh, like everyone is saying, um, the, the technological possibilities we have are, are miraculous and yet they can be a very lonely prom, uh, proposition of, you know, you know, from the position of the Shalich Tzibor of singing to a screen um, or the congregants just, you know, in their, in their own little squares, you know, um, I don't want to say passively, but being present, but not being able to engage in the, in the, in the usual way. So I feel that, um, having as many people um, as possible to participate so we can hear their voices and not just sit and listen to the, the cantor or the spiritual leader sing or you know, teach or whatever the, whatever the moment calls for. Um, I feel that uh, moments of just taking stock, literally breathing, you know, at reform synagogues all across the country now have, you know, because of meditation and, and you know, new spiritual approaches, often take moments of breath or moments of, of awareness. And during this time, that has become all the more important. Uh, people literally are not breathing. You know, we, we go around with masks all, you know, throughout our lives. And, you know, all the emotional holding in and anticipation and anxiety. So creating this, this sacred time on Shabbat where we actually together can just exhale several times and, 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 and be part of, um, of a community that, that's embracing one another in the ways that we can is very, very important. Um, also, uh, gratitude. I feel that um, the way through hardship is through gratitude. The way through challenge, um, you must be in touch with your gratitude. If you are going to get through something that is painful or difficult, gratitude is the first, first step out of that. And so every um, service in some way or another, whether, whether it's through music or through literally acknowledging or drawing attention to a prayer, um, being aware of uh, how things are difficult and yet how much we have to be grateful for at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Joyce Rosenzweig. Thank you. Yeah, Jonathan, what you just said about gratitude, I mean, I, I resonate so, so much with that. I think we all do. And um, the um, Psalm 92 has always had a very special moment, a special place in our um, Kabbalah Shabbat services. But I do believe that um, since... Um, the pandemic, it has taken on even a greater, greater meaning for all of us. And um, I, I guess I wanted to say, you know, to start by saying what a privilege it is to be in this leadership role at this particular time. It always has been. I've never at all taken for granted that I, at, that I was just hired pianist. Uh, I mean, it's my role has expanded and expanded over the years. And I have 
always been in, you know, the um, um, the one that that coordinates the our the choices for services um, and the rich services that we do and working with our our cantors. Um, but nowadays, it feels like it's it's such a bigger it's such a bigger responsibility, and um, it's the time. That, it, that we spend crafting a service, thinking about every aspect of it, the architecture of the service, the, 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 um, what is happening in our, in our Jewish world, what is happening in the secular world, um, what setting would be just right for this particular Shabbat. Um, it's become more and more crucial. Um, our choir is very beloved in our congregation and it's played a significant role um, over the years. And what we've done to keep that alive, um, since we can't, do, as everyone knows, we can't have choral singing, we have videos of them. So we play them from, from every service will have l'chadudi from a particular service that they, um, that they participated in. Also, to hear many voices together, since we can't hear many voices. Um, and it's, people are always writing in the chat how wonderful it is to see their fellow congregants singing, you know, because we'll have a, well, our choir is about 45 people, so it's a lot of congregants, and that's very meaningful. We're not on Zoom, so we're not at a platform where people are actually seeing faces, like some of my colleagues um, are, um, but, the chat actually has become very, very important for people. People give Shabbat greetings and people catch up with each other. It's so moving. We'll have a thousand different chats go, you know, over the course of an evening. It's, um, it's vital to people. Um, we've, uh, from the beginning, we realized that we have our own Sidur and we realized that it's important for people to pray with the Sidur in hand. So we've had wonderful um, uh, underwriters that have stepped up and said, we want to make sure that everyone has their own Sidur. Um, and this, and now I think we are, we're up to 90 something percent of, of people that watch our services have a Sidur. Um, it's interesting, people send in pictures of their Shabbat setup with their cameras, their computers, their candlesticks. And it's become a thing that we put in our um, in our a weekly um, e-news that goes out. Um, I think there's just, we, we try to involve um, as many congregants as, we, as possible um, to honor them in different ways, to read different things as, as my colleagues I'm sure do in their congregations as well. Um, and uh, to bring our, just to bring the, bring the message as close to people's hearts as possible. Thank you, Joyce. Um, so, uh, Cantor Schwartz just messaged me and said um, that everybody has done such a great job answering the question that let's, uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna ask him the next question. I know that Ozzy has to leave soon to deal with uh, an emergency. So um, I'm going to uh, post a link to Mary's article that I referenced in the chat right now. And I encourage you to read it um, when you have the time. Um, and um, I'm going to reverse the order now. And Ozzy, I'll ask you uh, this question. And we'll, we'll go backwards, if that's OK with everybody, because I know you have to go, Ozzy. Um, <clears throat> the, the question is this. Constraint often breeds creativity. And this has certainly been the case during the pandemic. Please describe one instance in which you've been forced to think creatively about music and prayer during the pandemic, leading to an outcome that you would deem successful. What is your takeaway learning from your solution to the problem? Yeah, so uh, look, a, a, a crisis, not just creativity, a crisis is also an opportunity, right? So um, there was, there's been a lot of looking at our situation uh, also as an opportunity, you know, from a personal level, right? Like I have four kids at home and uh, uh, for a long time they didn't go to school and my wife is a doctor. And so there's been a lot of challenges here and, 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 and I'm happy to say it's been an exhausting year, but also um, walking out of this year with a lot of learning and a lot of, um, uh, uh, um, maybe 
things that are more efficient and creative solutions to problems that have been very old, uh, uh, both at home and, and at work. So focusing at work and focusing at, at, at the synagogue to give one example, right? Um, uh, before the high holidays, right, we were very concerned traditionally at Park Avenue Synagogue with such a big history of choral music, right? We, 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 we normally have a big choir and uh, singers have been uh, uh, described as super spreaders and, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, that from a health perspective, it became very, um, uh, dangerous to have uh, singers uh, in the same room singing together. So, you know, one creative idea that emerged was, you know, let's let's uh, replace the singers for this year, right? So, so we, we 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 keep what we can from the choral tradition and our intention is to go back there. But in the meantime, in order to uh, feel that sanctuary and, and the virtual sanctuary with, with a warm and beautiful and familiar sound, let's use some musical instruments that are safer to use from a health perspective. So some violins, for example, who are wearing masks and sitting in social distance are safer than singers, right? Uh, 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 standing in the sanctuary. So for the entire high holiday repertoire had to pivot really quickly. A lot of familiar settings had to get new arrangements for strings and some other harp, other instruments, right, that, that, that we had. Um, and also, you know, from a spiritual uh, perspective, we wanted to feel that empty sanctuary with people, almost like angels. And the musicians, again, became those, right, that community, that sibur, right, that help us um, communicate a feeling of beyachad, of togetherness uh, to the people who are watching at home, feeling that they are part of something that is done uh, together. So it's again, it's it's one example how, you know, musically uh, the creativity and, and the hard work of the music team becomes you know, and, 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 and the result was really wonderful. I've never heard Kol Nidre or San Kol Nidre or, right, uh, thought about so, some, someone who, it gave a new meaning to many of the prayers and, and I hope, right? So some of these arrangements and some of these musical instruments maybe can stay, right? And, and, and can work with our choir when it's safe for the choir to return, right? So, so I think it's, again, it's, it's, it was an opportunity that hopefully will, will have a lasting effect in a, in a positive way um, on how our repertoire uh, and, and high holiday expression, expression is richer. Thank you, Ozzy. Um, let's go, um, well, I guess we're going backwards. So uh, Joyce. Great. Okay. I just, I have so many ideas to share, but I guess just, I, I would just um, share just one, which is um, that we made um, many um, virtual choir videos and um, it's, it's been a, a lot of work and we're going to be making more, we know, because we're committed to uh, keeping this uh, choral music alive as much as we can at this time. Um, but it's interesting, like for our congregation, um, a singing of Achat Sha'alti throughout Elul and beyond um, through Hoshana Rabbah has been something that our congregants, they wait for all year round and it means the world to them. So just, we knew that was, one, that was something that we needed to do and um, in, a beautiful, in a, a beautiful arrangement and that was played throughout the month and throughout our high, high holy days. And there was a comfort that we weren't that far away from, you know, from our normalcy, as long as we heard that melody. So, you know, I think it's just, it's about shifting a platform, shifting the way we do it. And it's hard for people. My, my choir members are not at all, from, who is, who is uh, who does understand, you know, naturally, natively, how to make how to stand by yourself, sadly, and not sing, not sing and hear other voices, but sound by yourself and record. But this is what we've all learned to do this year. And these um, videos have served us very well, both for concerts that we've done as well as for services. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, Jonathan, we turn to you. Yeah, I just want to share um, a little uh, creative project that I, I was uh, commissioned to work on. And it, it, Ozzy, it, it, it dovetails with um, 
you know, the use of, of instrumental music in your, in your um, amazing congregation. So um, I'll, I'll briefly describe um, he, uh, the synagogue Hevra, Hevra, they, they call it, of Southern Berkshire. It's a, it's a really innovative uh, community reform synagogue. Um, the rabbi Neil Hirsch, and he may be on this call, he said, look, at, we, I want to try something innovative and creative. My community is a block, or a, so to speak, from uh, Tanglewood. They love classical music. They love chamber music and orchestral music. And is there any way that we could create some kind of a, an experience for them musically that it's not going to replace, but in some way could be rich for them, for Kol Nidre? We can't hear human voices in our sanctuary. So he, you know, we, we put together our heads and I said, look, let's, let's take some of the beloved melodies of the High Holy Days and I will, I will arrange them in an elegant way that, that people can have um, a spiritual experience of hearing music in, with um, classical instruments that they, that they revere and love and as, as part of their cultural life in, in, you know, in the Tanglewood area. So I'm gonna uh, share with you uh, one of the videos, it, it's a few minutes, um, and we had um, a violin, a cello, a clarinet, and a harp, and, and me at the piano. So one second. Technology. Okay. And all right, let's, I guess we'll do the Baruch and the Mari Varavim. Uh, leading into Ahavat Olam. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you, Jonathan. That was gorgeous. So, uh, Mary, we come to you. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, the, the question was about um, constraints bringing creativity and what is um, one instance in which you've been forced to think creatively about music and prayer during the pandemic and uh, leading to an outcome that you would deem successful. And what was your takeaway learning from that? Thank you for speaking first. I needed to just kind of... Uh take a breath after that beautiful sharing, Jonathan. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'll share one idea, and it really is just kind of an adaptation of this whole idea of all those beautiful choir videos that we've seen, or in this case, an instrumental video. Um, and also it had to do with high holidays, right? Because that was that holiday that we had kind of enough time to get it together. And we knew that our communities were yearning to feel the specialness, specialness of the high holidays. And how were we gonna do this on Zoom? So we decided to apply the technology that's normally used for these instrumental or choir videos and use it for the spoken word. So the Chavara that I lead actually is a, uh, for high holidays is a Chavara that I'm a part of. And one of our members years ago wrote a beautiful um, English reading about our Chavara, what's at the center of our Chavara, just a beautiful reading. We decided to send each family the written prayer and ask them to read through the entire prayer, to record themselves reading through the whole prayer. Then we received all the prayers, right, every family, and we shifted that over to some technological whiz who could put this together. With each family, if you imagine the boxes that we're looking at right now, there'd be this prayer and I would begin and the next person would say the next phrase, sentence, and literally by the end of it, you saw this whole, you know, whole screen of families sharing this incredible prayer that had so much meaning to all of us. The prayer happened at the very beginning, um, towards the beginning, I should say, of Erev Rosh Hashanah, and then a screenshot of the people that were a part of, of sharing the prayer was what the, uh, the service ended with. And then, of course, we brought it back for Ni'ilah. It was an incredible highlight of the service. Everyone felt seen and heard. They were empowered and energized there was real buy-in because they were a part of creating this. And by the way, they didn't have to be able to sing. All they had to be able to do was read. Um, it was incredibly labor intensive as Joyce has already spoken to in a number of us, making these videos is crazy. So sending out the instructions and by the way, one of our members who's 93, I remember my husband driving over to her home, she lives by herself to help her record so she could be a part of this. It was labor intensive and well worth it. And the takeaway is what we've all been saying from the beginning, which is people need to feel the connection. They need to feel seen and heard even amidst the majesty and grandeur of the Amim Noraim. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so our, our fourth and final question before we open it up to uh, questions uh, from, from everyone here. Um, so I'd like to uh, turn from the synagogue practice to ritual on a smaller but important scale. Um, we're now looking forward to the holiday of Passover, a time that perhaps more than ever for contemporary Jews is marked by home ritual with family and season. Right now between Purim and Passover, as I mentioned earlier, also marks one year since American synagogues shut their doors. Can you describe what Passover was like for you last year and what, if anything, you plan to do differently this year based on your experience with music, prayer, and Zoom? Um, we'll uh, continue the order we started before. So Joyce Rosenzweig. 
Great. Um, so, you know, we, like, I think like all of us, we, we felt such, such sadness that we, we were going to have to be separated from those we love. And we were, that Passover was going to look different. Our Seder, that we yearned to, we, we yearned to be together and celebrate with the traditions that each of us has come so accustomed to um, feeling um, would have to change this year. And it, we, we recognized there was loss. We had no idea how many people would actually attend. We, um, um, we ha had a, a Zoom room that was for 500. Then we thought, oh my gosh, we'll never, we'll never fill that up. And we maxed out way before the Seder even began because people were yearning to be together and people were contacting their families from across the country and saying, tune in so we can all be together. At least we can be experiencing the same thing. And it was very powerful. Um, and people set up their own Seder plates, their own ritual objects. And um, I would just say that um, we had rather traditional Seder. We um, used, now I'm forgetting the, the title this very second. Let, oh, maybe somebody can help me. Uh, let freedom something, blah, blah, blah. I can't remember the name of the, of the um, anyway. <laughs> another time um but it um it served us well we we in, in allowed a lot of uh congregants to speak to share um readings we experimented maybe for the first time with having duets musically and um, um what that would mean to layer one singer or send the track send it to someone else so we had multiple voices always singing um, try to bring in music um, from many traditions um, that I made tracks for. So I love that. I love bringing in music from Calcutta or from, you know, the, the German tradition, whatever. It's, it makes it just rich for everyone. But, you know, with hopefully the tunes that we, we grew up with, many of us grew up with as well, that we come to expect. Um, and... I think that there was a warmth that we, we just were trying to go for and a humor and a lightness. And uh, this year I'm hoping that we're going to um, build on some of the ideas that has, have been said by my colleagues. We want to get more congregational reading, not just singing, reading in and congregational singing. So my choir is planning to, we're, we're going to be recording some unison singing and it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be. And so that people can hear multiple voices during the Seder um, and, um, you know, hope for a, a, a time, hopefully next year that we can actually, we don't have to, we don't have to um, make these, these strange plans um, um, to be together. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Jonathan. Yeah, I don't know if I have a lot to add in terms of the, the logistics of Pesach, but um, thematically, um, the, the word, uh, I, I was just a part of this, I, I'm part of this spiritual community um, where we, we contemplate different texts and um, the word that keeps coming back to me after this year of <laughs> everything we've been through is um, awakening. And how um, you know going through trial um, is an opportunity for awakening, and min habetzar and coming from the narrow place of the narrows. Um, I would love my congregation and <laughs> everyone in the world and my students and um, to just think about how has this been a time of awakening? What has awakened in us during the past year? And um, if the answer is nothing, um, <laughs> you've been asleep. <laughs> so, um, you know, in a, I'm saying that in a, in a gentle, loving way. But um, I think it's an opportunity for us to, to really take stock of what we have learned and how we have grown. And Passover is 
a beautiful um, opportunity for that. Thank you, Jonathan and Mary. So last year's Pesach, I will admit, snuck up on us. Um, my husband and I actually had just recovered from COVID, I say with incredible gratitude. So we didn't have a great deal of energy and time. And here's what we did last year. We sent out a PDF of an abridged Haggadah, as I explained earlier, the importance of being able to see faces, not having to put the text on the screen, with assigned parts for all of our family members. We're normally about 30 or 35 that gather in our home. Um, we asked all the parents in each home to hide their own afikomen and make sure they had a present for their kid. Um, we always do a play. Uh, I have uh, two artists for kids. Uh, one of them is in theater. So, you know, my son Adam would rehearse a little play with them live, but this time he had a Zoom rehearsal with the children. And the parents had to make sure the kids showed up a week before for their Zoom rehearsal. Uh, and then, of course, we made sure to do the entire ritual prior to the meal so that then people could sign off and have dinner with their families. This year, we have time. So I will say in total transparency, we are uh, wrestling right now with how to handle a hybrid Seder. Because thankfully, there are a number of our family members who will have had their second vaccine and will be able to come to our home. But it's not clear how we handle the people, those people and also people on the screen. We as educators are also wondering about that challenge. Um, now we have time to include creative readings. And there are many, many readings. Um, and, and readings about our new understanding of what it means to be in a narrow place, as Gordon mentioned at the very beginning. Um, our new understanding of enslavement. Our new understanding of what liberation must have felt like. So we're definitely going to include that in our Haggadah. Um, and then using the newly learned technological abilities that Zoom affords us. So we're figuring about how we could use breakout rooms. Maybe put the little kids in one little room. I'm not sure yet. We're working on it. Um, share screen. Definitely ways of sharing the screen for certain ideas. Um, share YouTube videos. Uh, Contemporary music, Shana Taub, if you don't know of this piece, um, wrote a piece called Huddled Masses, and it is just spectacular. And it speaks to the immigrant experience and, of course, the connection in Pesach of, to remember what it is to be a stranger in a strange land. And then also use Kahoot, which is a, a game app that I've learned from my grandchildren, um, where they can, we can uh, create some games that they can play based on Pesach stories and Pesach knowledge. And mostly, what I've learned after almost a year of doing this, lo bashamayim hi. We can do this. It's not in the heavens. We can do this. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I love that we ended up on that. Uh, ended on that uplifting note. Um, and thank you to all the uh, presenters for, for these fascinating insights. There's a lot here. Um, so we'll now turn to questions, perhaps to get us started. Um, uh, Jonathan, your beautiful um, arrangement um, uh, elicited a number of uh, the um, in the chat, many of them just simply praise because it's just gorgeous. Um, so I want to ask, um, Alex, if you don't mind, you, you brought up an interesting uh, point about the difference between um, choral singing and uh, instrumental music. Would you like to uh, explain your question and comment for anybody who's not keeping it? And then Jonathan, perhaps you can reply. Sure. Hi, Jonathan. Um, nice to see you again. It's great to see you. I respect what you do entirely and the music is moving and beautiful and meaningful but with a service like Kol Nidre or, the, uh, or Yom Kippur the, the whole thing is the humming and the and the joining in of the congregational singing with the choir and the cantor you can't replicate it and you can't sort of throw it out and you can't even modernize um, Yom in the Rhine services, even if you wanted to, because it doesn't fit. Any time of the year that you have Pesach, you can do modern Hanukkah, Sukkot, Shabbat, but on Yom in the Rhine, 
there's, there's a certain atmosphere that you bring into the synagogue that you have that connection and even on zoom you have to try and create that connection and the congregation at home like i would do would be humming along or um, singing along with the tunes that they know so what is the answer how do you how do you change it? i i find it very very difficult you know can should i can i respond please please do uh, yeah first of all thank you alex I, I i love your question and um i i have to say i'm with you there <laughs> there's nothing like um a choir singing um on the high holy days it is uh it's a transcendent phenomenon to hear uh, voices and and we we crave that and it, it it facilitates the spiritual experience so and and you know this this idea of this project of you know doing a little uh, a chamber chamber moments of um from the high holy days um was not boldly saying you know what we can be just as good as, as a choir it was more okay this is what we have this year this is going to be a challenge and we you know for health reasons we can't gather i mean we, we certainly people tried to use the technology to make up for not the absence of the choir and you know and they've done amazing things you know with with all these virtual techno uh, choral um logistics that they put together amazing stuff um but this was designed for a community that um feels a spirituality through music through instrumental music and um and there was this idea that um somehow that they could find something more internal something more um yeah something that that could bring them another kind of oral experience with an a-u-r-a-l um yeah but it was not designed to equate or um, push choral music to the side it was um, a creative approach for this very unprecedented year in the history of the jewish people thank you jonathan um, so I want to open it up for questions now. A number of you have, uh, have submitted questions now, but um, in case anybody's not um, been watching the chat or, or not had facility with entering a question in the chat, um, I want to give an opportunity now or else I'll just uh, call on people. So if anybody has a question, please raise either your physical or virtual hand. Um, Cantor Zoe Jacobs asked a question in the chat. Um, uh, Cantor Jacobs, oh, there you are. Uh, would you like to just uh, speak out your question out loud? Sure. Hi. Um, so my um, my question came, Joyce, when you were talking about making the videos of your choir, because um, we also have a large lay choir, and what we found is that where that community of musicians were able to come together, so to speak, in real life and sing quite complicated SATB pieces because they had the support of the other people on their part. When we then said, great, you've been singing the same song for 40 years. Could you please record the tenor part? The answer was no, not really. Or yes, here you go, but it doesn't actually sound like the tenor part. Um, and I just, I'm wondering, have you chosen simpler, um, simpler melodies have you not have you done the same sort of material different material do you have strategies for supporting your singers so that they don't feel like they're failing um we've really it, it's really um knocked the confidence of some of our singers and we've had to do a lot of work on that and i would just love to to learn from you what you've done to support your musicians to make that easier so we, i could not uh, i couldn't agree with everything you're saying it's it's um such a challenge it's been so challenging and you know for people for our people that have been feeling so much loss and in their lives in general and loss not seeing people to make these on their own have been very challenging psychologically emotionally and there's a lot of hand holding that goes into this and uh, confidence building uh, it's just, 
there is no way around it. And you're so right. The, even something that they have sung for years suddenly becomes much more, much more difficult. You know, I, it's funny that I, we started out, our first video was um, Enosh by Lewandowski. Um, and it just happened that way because we um, were um, doing a concert um, that I felt that was the perfect opening uh, piece. It was, it was recognizing the time period that we're in um, and the loss that, that, that the whole world has, has experienced. And um, it's, a, it's a selection that we have included in our Yisker service for many, many years, but suddenly it became something else. I think it's, so I record the piano part I record um, the, the um, vocal lines. We have guide singers, as most people do, that record over that. I'm, I conduct. And then, you know, you work with the tracks um, after that and try to make the editing as good as possible. But the, 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 um, we've lost some people along the way that have said, honestly, they just can't do it. They can't make the technology work. Um, it's sad. And we know they'll be back you know, when there's a live, um, present, uh, live possibilities. But um, it's interesting, I, my people want a challenge. It's like they want it and they're scared of it at the same time. And I, um, they, want to, they want to keep their, their skills up. And I feel like that's part of my job is to, 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 to support them in, in that. So it takes a lot of time. It's just crazy. And we have our, we have Zoom rehe rehearsals like, because that's the only kind of rehearsals. And we have private sessions and we have sectionals. And um, it's, it's, you know, we're all proud of it when it comes together. That's, that's all. We're proud, but we know the blood and sweat that was behind it. And it gets a little bit easier over time. We've made a bunch now, but it's each time um, I, I worry, I worry about the toll that it's going to take on all of us. So, and it's, that's all I can say is that I think they're worth it because I, I believe so strongly in choral singing, but the short answer is that it's, um, it's a big challenge. Um, I wish I could be more reassuring than that, but, but when it, but when it comes together, there is celebration and that is worth so much. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you for the question. Um, uh, Cantor, Neil Schwartz, I see your hand is raised. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So I had put in the chat uh, something that, upon reflection, I realize only works for Zoom, I think. And that is, I commented that the most important thing that we do, much more important than the content of any service I do, any Shabbos, uh, is that I start, I open it 30 minutes early, they glom in and chat with each other right up until I say, okay, it's time to light candles. And then I leave it for anywhere from 30 to sometimes if I'm feeling really generous or not too tired, 45 minutes after the service is done. And they chat and chat and chat and chat right up until I say, okay, I want to go home. I want to go home. My question is, is this anything that can be done with those of you who are in the situations where you're using live stream? Or is this just unique to the Zoom situation of us smaller congregations? It's been perhaps the most important aspect of staying together as a community during Zoom. Thank you for the question. Anybody want to reply? Joyce, yeah. I'll just say quickly that um, we do have um, 30 minutes before our services. We, um, um, our tech person, uh-oh, what had just happened? Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, I guess I'm back. Um, um, we play music from different concerts that we've done over the last five years um, of theme of these different themes that we've focused on. And it features, um, it just features music from different genres, different Jewish music and some secular music. And so it's very, people love it. And it puts, it gets people in to some sort of a cohesive place for the service. And um, 
And it's very sweet to bring back these memories of lots of choral music and other music as well. After the services, we've often we don't we've often have um, uh, zone uh, zone eggs, which we call them instead of own eggs on Zoom. And um, we all have different programming that happens actually, and a speaker or discussion. And it's kind of wild how many people actually stay. Our services are long. Our services are an hour and a half, but people want to stay and want to interact with each other and, and look, keep learning. So it's, it's, we've kind of had the opposite uh, to many synagogues that are reducing the size of their services. We kind of expand and for some reason they're coming along. So we're, we're, we're very grateful. Thank you. Mary or Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, I see your hand is raised. Hi, uh, sorry to ask the questions again, but um, I'm interested in what you consider traditional music in your synagogue and what you consider new. Do you call traditional the Lewandowski Zulz and Mamba stuff? Or, and do you, or do you use best styles, Debbie Friedman, Souls in, Karbach, Michael Shapiro, and music of that ilk? I mean, what do your congregations know and what do they, are they familiar with? Or, and um, how do you go about this if they're not familiar with the old school as opposed to the new school? Or do you find that you need to introduce more of this um, hip stuff, modern stuff? Um, I don't know how you go, how you do these things, especially for um, a festival like Pesach or Hanukkah or um, where congregational singing and joining along. And for those that maybe cannot read Hebrew, um, souls in probably with a la la la, and bim bam bam bam, and that sort of thing. So you create an atmosphere and you don't embarrass people who may not be able to read Hebrew, so which way do you go? I'm going to defer to Mary Arian because she teaches a whole course on the Congregational Voice at Hebrew Union College, and she is my Rebbe on this topic. <laughs> That's interesting. You were my Rebbe, but okay. Look, um, Alex, of course, it's such an important question, right? Because people aren't coming to a, um, a concert subscription that they paid for to hear, you know, music of the Baroque era, uh, and all of a sudden someone's playing something from the Renaissance, okay? In other words, this is about worship, and this is really about meeting the needs of our congregants, and people come to worship for different reasons. You know, uh, our colleague Benji Schiller might say they, they may come for meditative moments, they may come from majestic moments, they may come from moments of meeting, you know, all the M's that she's, she's uh, created. So, for me, there has to be a balance because I'm not sure who has come for the meditative moment or who's come for music of memory. I may want to sing Debbie Friedman, Shalom Aleichem, Zichron Vracha, but someone may really be longing for Goldfarb's Shalom Aleichem. So I think it's just a real acknowledgement. You know, when I look at my set list, as it were, for a service, I want to be able to see that all those moments are covered and I want to see a balance between the old and the new. And of course, you raise a great question. You know, for some people, the traditional Misha Berach is Debbie Friedman's. And don't you dare do anyone else's Misha Berach, right? So it's really an understanding that this is about prayer and enabling prayer for the variety, from the variety of perspectives that people come for and being aware of the balance. Fantastic answer, Mary. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan or Joyce, anything to add to that? Just to say that, you know, for many people that traditional means whatever they grew up with or whatever is familiar, most familiar to them. And, you know, I mean, I just, I think that we can strive to bring a, a variety of music, a, the biggest variety of music honoring the mu music that has been composed for these these words for hundreds of years, and 
I think for me, whichever we, whichever way we go, it's the integrity. It's the, it's the beauty that we bring to the setting. And I don't think I, I never want to limit what we're able to do, what we're able to, to bring to our congregations, because I think that there's something, there's a new way to hear these words, a new way to meditate on these words with a setting that, you know, that maybe is unfamiliar, but has something to give us. Maybe the focus is on a different part of the prayer than we normally, that we normally spend time on. And I think, I think it just comes down to being, having good taste, whatever that means. And of course that's gonna differ for each person, but to try to uphold the highest artistic standards in everything and spiritual standards. And, and at the same time, be a teacher to the congregation because where are they going to be able to experience this great music, these, this great, these great settings, except for the synagogue. So I feel an obligation to bring in music of many um, diverse peoples uh, of our people and um, diverse time periods. I'll just I'll just add uh, to what uh, Joyce and Mary have said. Um, I mean, when I think of uh, synagogues out in the world that are really modeling this kind of um, big tent eclecticism, CBST is at the top of the list. And if you if you go to their their wonderful services, um, there's always um, a program listing with the composer, the date that the, the composition was um, composed. And, you know, people really um, have a chance to say, wow, that that's a traditional melody that was that was composed in 1968. I thought it was like 18, 1810. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's just a small little example. Um, but what Joyce said is very true that we are one of the most important things we do is is to teach our congregations about the Mayafa uh, how, how beautiful is our inheritance in all the different styles of, of Jewish music. Thank you. Are there, uh, yes, Geraldine. Uh, this has been an absolutely fantastic presentation and we've learned so much. My, my kind of question is, uh, I'm sure that services, synagogues will never be the same because the amount of energy and investment that synagogues have made in communicating with their congregants I think it's something that will flow over to whatever system and however much, you know, the effort you're making to actually make them feel at home and make them feel welcome, make them feel that this is their place, is something that I'm sure will continue even when you are together. So I'm sure that's a positive. And I'm just wondering whether there are any negatives that people feel about having done this, where the people will come back to synagogue again. And also the fact that congregants have been able to hop around and pick and choose with their fingertips which service they actually like listening to and how that is going to impact on communities around the world. I wonder if they could talk about that. And Mary. Yeah, Geraldine, that, those are great questions that we're all thinking about for sure. I will say that I remember leading up during the summer, there were a number of um, meetings that uh, the, the, the rabbinic um, assembly was, was holding and can't, ACC, the cantorial assembly, thinking about what do we do for the high holidays? And of course, we all knew we had to somehow, you know, communicate and make the services shorter, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember Dr. Hoffman, Larry Hoffman, raised the question, we really need to look at what is valued. What, what does the clergy team value? What are those things that we think are so important and so special and so, we, we can't do without this for our, for our high holidays. And we have to find out from our congregants what is at the core of the high holidays for them, that if we didn't do it, they would feel like they weren't at the high holidays which was quite a learning because sometimes what we deem 
to be so necessary is not necessarily what the congregants feel. So there was a lot of learning, and I will tell you, there were many moments that we removed from our high holiday services that I really missed, but I didn't hear it from my congregants, right? So one of my fears is, can we go back to adding all these things, going back to those longer services? Um, and it's really something, we can't ignore the knowledge that we've gained, but we also want to be able to say to our congregants, let's get back to some of the traditions that we've created. So it's, it's a great question. Thank you. And uh, I know that Joyce has to leave now. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, and maybe this would be a time for me to just uh, name just a couple things that I've heard from this conversation that are uh, just so uh, fascinating. And thank you so much to, to the speakers. Um, as people are talking, I'm reflecting now on um, and how the role of the Shaliyah Tzibor has changed uh, so much as a result of this. Um, there are elements to the job of the Shaliyah Tzibor that um, certainly stretch back to well before the pandemic, but um, are, are heightened now in, uh, in such profound ways. And it, normally when I think of a shaliach tzibor, I think of the, the shaliach for the prayers, the emissary for the prayers of the community. And here we have the, the representative, the emissary of the community, of the creation of community. And the creation of community is um, a very challenging job in this world. And, uh, and this has become central to the job of the Shaliyah Tzibor, to the job of a cantor, and it's something that we're talking about in the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music all the time. Um, and to hear about the amount of creativity into this is really inspiring. Um, so it's something that I'm thinking about quite a bit uh, in the context of this conversation. Um, secondly, um, I'm struck by the humility of everyone here, not just in the way that you're presenting yourself and your um, and the amazing work that you're doing, but there's a humility that's necessary for doing this work of um, of the word is a Hebrew word mevatel to to nullify yourself for the needs of the community, right? To say I am going to see what my community needs right now, and I will do that. And it's a there's a certain selflessness that the uh, cantor or shaliach tzibor um, needing to do uh, right now. And uh, it's really striking. And I think something that's uh, historically significant. Um, and the final thing is something that Joyce said that uh, has, has just come up again and again for me as I'm listening to this. And that's that uh, that's the importance of not compromising. Um, it would be very excusable in this moment of so many constraints to compromise on the quality of music, on the quality of preparation that goes into it, uh, uh, into, into a service. And yet the people on this screen are showing that that's really not an option if people take seriously the work that they're doing. Um, the amount of uh, effort that has gone into this is palpable um, and the results justify that effort. And uh, so I want to commend all of you for, for the humility and the effort and, uh, and the ability to say that music is too important right now for us to compromise. And I think that this is uh, something that uh, is real learning for me. Uh, and uh, so I, I appreciate that very much. Um, Geraldine, I see that we're coming to our time now. Um, should we conclude or would you like to take another question or two? Um, if there are any more questions, we could certainly take them. Um, otherwise, I can add my words to you that the speakers have been inspirational and given us many ideas and thoughts about what a service is about, who is it for, and um, they've come up with, as you say, so many creative and wonderful ideas. So thank you, Gordon, and thank you to all your panel for really enlightening us and illuminating what's important about this and to the questioners to hear uh, your responses and what you have to say. So 
really, really grateful for that. Um, if I may take a moment to tell you what's on um, <laughs> what to look forward to on COS, which next week, I'm not sure what to make of it because we have so many different kinds of Jewish music <laughs> on these conversations. This one is called Judeo-Futuristic Poetry and Music, Cosmic Diaspora's New CD, Purple Tentacles of Thought and Desire. Now, you make of it what you will, but we have Joshua Horowitz, a really wonderful musician and well-respected across the whole um, panoply of Jewish music, at the helm of this with some colleagues. And I'm sure we're in for some sort of treat, uh, even if it may be something um, unusual. Um, after that, uh, on the 16th of March, we've got Ilana Webster Kogan from SOAS, who's the Joe Loss Lecturer in Jewish Music. She'll be talking to Phil Alexander, who has done uh, a doctorate with her, and his new book has just been published. It's called Sounding Jewish in Berlin, Klezma and the Contemporary City. After that, we have a double session, two weeks in a row. Boaz Tarsi with Amalia Kedem is going to attack the subject, tackle the subject, I wouldn't say attack. Does Ashkenazi synagogue music have a theory? Part one is what happens when you do not let the facts confuse you. And part two will be facing the facts. So if you want a real intellectual channel challenge, that's coming at the end of March. So a lot to look forward to. And I mentioned at the beginning when you were there that there's a new season of things started by the European Cantors Association, of which Alex Klein, who you've heard about, mentioned a bit, and he is at the head of this. It's called The Voice of the Cantor. And for this series, we're not asking the cantors to sing. We're asking them about their opinions. What is it like to be a cantor in the Jewish world today? What are the hopes and fears? What are the joys? What are the difficulties? And uh, we really look forward to an amazing series of talks on what, who needs Nusach? Do we need a choir? Do we need a rabbi? Um, you know, really tough questions. So those are fortnightly on a Wednesday and they're starting tomorrow with Alex talking to Dudu Fisher, how he manages to be a cantor on the Bima and the stage. And so that one, you need to register with Cantor's Assembly because we're connecting with them to, to for the first session. They are uh, co-hosting it with us. But for everything, if you go to the e European Cantors Association website, it's very easy to remember. It's cantors.eu, obviously with the www beforehand. Cantors.eu for Europe, okay? Cantors.eu, you'll find out how to register for tomorrow. You'll see the whole program of the future series, and um, you will see how to register for each of those sessions. So uh, is there anybody who'd like to ask any questions about anything else uh, um, other than uh, our wonderful session today, for which we are grateful thanks to Gordon and to Mary and to Joyce and Jonathan and um, Azzy. You know, each one is inspirational in, in so many ways. So um, I'll say then that we look forward to seeing you um, tomorrow or next Tuesday and whenever after that. I would just like to finish by um, a personal thank you to Gordon, Mary, um, everybody else who was here who participated because it was a, an exceptionally good um, session. Um, I've learned a lot. 
I, you have my utmost respect and love for the what you do, especially in these trying times with the pandemic. And if we at the ECA or I could help you or collaborate with you, it would be my greatest pleasure. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alex. And we all echo those thoughts.